As our next uh, presenter, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rainer Pika from Austria, who will be talking about profound Ayurvedic principles um, that have been confirmed by scientific research. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. So once again, uh, my thanks go to Thomas Pfeiffer and his organizing team for inviting me to this really august, august assembly. And uh, again, it's a joy to see all the friends that I've met before that work and give their lifetime to spread traditional and integrated medicine systems and also to meet new people and new friends to work together in networking and bring forward uh, uh, holistic health uh, to the entire world. My presentation today is on modern science discovers Ayurvedic concepts and we have been talking a lot already on integrated medicines and how we do best to integrate and to show our strengths to the authorities and, and ruling and stakeholders to implement um, holistic and integrated systems into the mainstream medicine. But I want to share one uh, side of this, which doesn't take any effort from our sides, and that is modern medicine itself, uh, which discovers uh, traditional systems and age-old principles. My late father always told me in a negotiation with someone, if you try to convince someone the best way to do it, to have the partner coming up with your own ideas. That makes it easy. And actually that is happening right now in the last few years uh, with modern medicine. And I will just give you a few examples. There are much more. Uh, at present, we know we see basically two different worlds. One is the modern medicine or conventional medicine. The other is traditional medicine or Ayurveda, in my case, is my specialty. And uh, for the patients, this is a hard time because he has, has to find his own way to find the best experts, either modern or traditional. So it's a, it's a challenge and uh, integrative medicine is aimed to unify all the systems and to make it easy for the patient and so the patient just go to an expert where he receives the best medicine, whatever this may be. It could be a change in diet, could be uh, some herbs, some tea, some purification, some touch, some smell, whatever it is. So uh, I mentioned presently mainstream medicine is in the forefront and is the, is the mainstream medicine. And uh, I want to show you now a few examples of how these two systems are slowly and slowly integrating. And I just put here a few Sanskrit words. Many of you, I think Ayurveda is quite a big topic here, understand this. I will just take a few examples which I read in this short 10, 15 minutes presentation. One is the Prakriti, which means the constitution of a person in Ayurveda called Prakriti, is Vata, Pit and Kapha. And uh, we heard today from Madan uh, that uh, there is a pan genomic uh, new research uh, published in Nature. And many years ago in Nature, there was another study on iogenomics. And I don't explain this uh, complicated box uh, plot chart, uh, not now, but in principle says that if a Vaidya, an Indian Ayurveda expert, uh, <clears throat> evaluates the prakriti of a person, which means the constitution, according to what bit Kaffa, we can find the same constitution in our genes. The special genes uh, that, uh, you know, define how we look like and how we behave. And there's a quite a perfect match between the genome and the prakriti according to the evaluation of an Ayurvedic expert. So that's a fascinating thing. So instead of taking the bias or looking at the person, we can also test the saliva or hair analysis or whatever to define the prakriti of a person. So this is a quite fascinating. And then in Ayurveda, a big topic is ama, which means uh, literally undigested food or waste in our body a term which modern medicine usually rejects that it exists. You know, there's normal waste and end product of metabolism, and this is anyway discharged to the liver and, and stools and kidneys. But uh, in 2016, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for the discovery of autophagy. And autophagy means auto self, and phagy means eating, devour. It's the self-digestion of cell waste, 
and even modern medicine creates this new word, cell waste, for what we call in Ayurveda, AMA. And uh, examples of this are Alzheimer's disease. This is a deposit of amyloid deposit, which is an end product of metabolism of the neurons in the brain. Or we have now a disease called MSC, or multiple chemical sensitivity, because there are now 85,000 environmental toxins that are identified that can create sicknesses in our physiology. So I mentioned autophagy. I think it's interesting that uh, the Sanskrit or the Ayurvedic word for eliminating ama is called ama bachana. Ama is the cell waste and bacha means to digest, to eat up. So there is actually a synonym, autophagy and ama bachana is if you translate in your language is the same. So it's amazing that the new Nobel Prize discovery of autophagy is the same as what uh, Ayurveda does since uh, millennia. And actually, Ayurveda offers already a wide range of autophagy activation, like the importance of timely eating when you're hungry and you have a good gap between meals. And there are even herbs that can activate autophagy, like Amapachana herbs, we call them in Ayurveda. And uh, it's uh, interesting that modern medicine is now have, has one focus point on researching and developing so-called autophagy activator drugs. So these drugs are already available in Ayurveda. They are ancient herbs that are called Amabachana herbs. They are safe, and we have thousands of years of experience with this. And uh, the next uh, topic is uh, Dinacharya has been mentioned also by Madan, I think, yesterday in his introduction, Dinacharya and uh, Ritucharya and Dinacharya. Dinacharya is a daily routine, and also here, the word chronobiology is kind of uh, enforcing this age-old system and here also a Nobel Prize, just one year after the other one in 2017. The prize has been given to the discovery of the circadian rhythm in the human brain. It's quite interesting and there is, it's now clear that if you treat a disease and also for the success of any intervention, even surgery, that can be influenced by the time of the day when you do your treatments. So there are many examples when you give the blood pressure medicine and the cholesterol lowering medicine, even in modern medicine, they are now giving at specific times. And it's clear that the chronic misalignment between the lifestyle and the inner clock is associated with an increased risk of disease. So, and that is what all about Ayurveda. Ayurveda is the champion of lifestyle medicine and about daily routine and when to eat and when to not eat and what to eat at the right time and so forth. And uh, I mentioned the uh, inner clock. I don't go now in this, it takes maybe 10 minutes to explain this chart, but what you see here basically is in the middle of the brain um, is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's, it's in a part of the hypothalamus, really in the middle of the brain, connected to the nerves from the eye. And what you see here, these yellow bubbles, this are the, is the nucleus. And in our genes, we have two genes that are called period and timeless, P-E-R and T-I-M. These are two genes that are important for our clock. And I don't go into details, they create protein, some are degraded by the sun, some not, I don't. But it takes about 24 hours for the cycle to complete, unless again, this, uh, these genes are expressed and delivered to the, to the cell. And uh, like any other clock, it's a little bit longer than 24 hours. So if the mobile phone goes automatic, but if you have a mechanical watch, you have to adjust every few days a little bit. And the same is our inner clock. It goes 24 hours, but you need adjustments. The main is the sunlight, and, and, but the others is when you wake up, when you go to sleep, and when you have your meals. These are the time givers of our clock, and this you need every day in the correct, uh, regular way to uphold the perfect circadian rhythm. So this discovery of the inner clock is quite amazing and supporting uh, Dinacharya, Dinacharya of the Ayurvedic system. And the last point for, for this, um, presentation, I want to say about Sandi Prakash. Sandi means the gap, and Prakash is the light, so the gap between darkness and, and light, which is uh, a Sanskrit word for the morning sunrise. And we know in uh, many traditional systems, the sunrise is very special. 
Uh, it's we do Surya Namaskar, which is the sun greeting exercise facing east, the rising sun, ideally. Uh, in Ayurveda, is something called like sun gazing. You watch the first few minutes of the rising sun, and it gives increases energy. We have many morning rituals in in in, in the in the Eastern world, um, which is sometimes connected to religion. Uh, we have Stapatya Veda, which is the Vedic architecture, where the main uh, one of the main rules is that you have many windows to the east and there is no obstruction to the east, no mountain in the east. So the purpose is to see the rising sun. And so there are many examples in, uh, in Ayurveda, and one of the really great uh, uh, experts is late uh, uh, Triguna, one of the greatest exponents of Ayurveda of, uh, in India. He was once asked, what is the best medicine to give to any person in any circumstances? And the answer was, is a walk during the sunrise in the morning. So what is about sunrise? We emphasize so much on this, and there is no clue other than religious or rituals or something that kind of supports this idea. But now uh, there is a research that the morning light emits a pure what is called NIR, near infrared light. This is a very special light that is only happening in the first 50 minutes of the day. Uh, of course, when the sun is up in the middle at noon, the near infrared light is even stronger, but then it's also mixed with U for B light, U for A light, which is damaging. And only the first 50 minutes, the atmosphere filters out all UVB and all other damaging radiations, and you have this purity of near infrared light in the early morning. And um, so that I already mentioned. And uh, now there is a uh, another study in, in this famous journal, uh, Nature, that uh, discovered that near-infrared light releases tissue melatonin. Please don't mix this up with the melatonin, melatonin from the pineal gland, which uh, increases when you go to sleep and the light goes down, is the sleeping hormone. But this is a hormone, it means it's secreted to the bloodstream. This tissue is a this is melatonin is a tissue melatonin. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's kept in the mitochondria. And this is released through the morning sunlight according to nature. And so I mentioned it has nothing to do with the sleeping hormone. And it's produced actually in the mitochondria. And it does something, it induces mitophagy, which is similar to autophagy, but it is kind of devouring, eating up the mitochondria. We heard also, I think, earlier today about the importance of uh, cleaning up with all the damaged mitochondria because they use the oxygen and they burn the food to energy, and there's a lot of damage and oxygen radicals that needs constantly purified, not of cleaning up. And mitophagy is the most important process in this, and it's induced by this tissue melatonin. So this is a wonderful uh, support of going out in the uh, early morning light. And this uh, mitophagy, this is connected to senescence research. It means to anti-aging research, to fighting cancer. It's really amazing if you go deeper into it. And this and uh, recommending to be out during sunrise is definitely one of the best medicines now supported by research in uh, this scientific journal Nature, which is considered to be one of the top research journals in the, in the world. Okay, so this I mentioned, and actually mito mitochondrial health is a recent uh, hot topic in modern medicine, a focus point in medicine, and um, we know that anything that we know is unhealthy, unhealthy lifestyle, not eating at the right time, stress, infections, Toxin, all of this cause uh, mitochondrial disease, more damage to the mitochondria. So it becomes more and more important to help uh, mitophagy to clean up with all this damaged mitochondria. Okay, this I mentioned already. The last, the very last point I wanted to mention is uh, disease caused by chronic stress. These are just a few examples. It's, uh, a lot, there's hardly any disease that is not connected with chronic stress. And um, I think this is a community where we do all kind of yoga and meditation, mindfulness, and I just wanted to uh, 
show to you another type of meditation from the field of yoga. It's a samadhi technique that I have learned from my teacher, Mahashi Mahesh Yogi. Uh, it's one of the widely researched over the last 50 years, there are 700 published research papers on transcendental meditation. And it's good thing is very easy to learn. It it's just takes five days, one and a half hours each. And uh, I will not take much more than a minute now. It takes 20 minutes twice a day. And you experience uh, pure consciousness. And it's a proven technology which I just wanted to introduce to you and uh, mentioned the studies. And uh, at the end, we can say that now modern medicine and Ayurvedic medicine are coming together more and more without us doing anything. It's easy. Uh, they are discovering traditional systems. And so in that way, we can think they will um, support the integration of, uh, of modern medicine and Ayurveda. Uh, I just... Uh, wanted to mention, if I'm loud, that uh, all of these um, programs here and much more about modern medicine and how this is discovered, um, supporting uh, traditional medicine, will be taught in a special program at the Slovenian uh, fully accredited university. It's now the first uh, and only, especially the only master degree in health sciences and Ayurveda and integrative medicine starting in October this year for the first time. And I have this uh, brochure here and I put it on the information center anyone can take home. And I want to close uh, with a quote of my teacher, Mahashi, Mahesh Yogi, because I heard a lot today that, you know, so much has been done by all of us in, in the alternative uh, medicine systems and we are not heard. It's kind of a pity that things are going on and the voice is not so much love and good things from our side and no response. And I wanted to share a quote from Hashim Yoga on this. He wrote this in his book, him, Love and God, on page 18. And uh, this is my last sentence for today. And he said, no drop of precious love is ever wasted. For every precious drop of love, flows into the unbounded ocean of bliss. And the ocean of bliss unfolds the love divine and fills the heart. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.